Press record and you cannot get going. I mean, being a small course in group, really, uh, it's probably not going to be as much performance uh, as, as, as um, it, it, it may have been, but you know, uh, nonetheless, I think hopefully it can be engaging, you know. Um, what I try to do with my poetry, I, don't, I usually say to people, I don't like performing for people or reciting to people, I like um, to perform with people. Okay, for them, I think this is something I borrow from our culture really, in the sense that, you know, you know, there's a communal aspect to poetry, which I'm sure all of you can relate uh, to really. So in a sense, well, I'm going to try and talk to you about um, the role of poetry in contemporary Zimbabwean politics. And of course, this is just my view of, of well, both politics as well as poetry. I think being at Oxford University, um, it would be quite a miss to forget to start mentioning people like Dambuzo Marichira, you know, um, who was here at Oxford University. Right. <laughs> right. right. Oh, oh, wow, there you go. <laughs> so in many ways, yeah, in many ways, I, I guess, you know, I, I, in some sense, could say I'm a contemporary of, of Marichira, uh, but also of many other people. Marichir, of course, a bit more radical in terms of his approach. Some maybe less so, but actually nonetheless inspiring. I'm going to read a few of my poems from my book, When This All Awakens. In a sense, what I wanted to, to, to talk about is that this idea that poetry in Zimbabwe tends to be viewed in a, in, 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 as kind of protest poetry. But I think there, there is a much broader role that poor poetry has played uh, in, in, in how I've experienced it. So poetry, I think, I would argue, has also been very motivational, um, but it has also been very visionary. It kind of helped us to see that actually there is a bit of light at the end of the tunnel, where sometimes, um, because of the events of the day, we struggle even to see the tunnel. I would argue it is it's not necessarily utopian, but actually deals with issues of the day um, and, and still insists that there can be um, you know, some hope, there can be a uh, reason to be optimistic. So, in this sense, I think, uh, given we've got 20 minutes, really, I'm going to start by uh, reading one of my pieces, uh, which is optimistic about Africa, in a sense, and, and by extension, I think, Zimbabwe, which is a title, We Start Again Africa. Um, yeah, when, when I finish, I'd like to hear what you think about the, the, the subject of discussion in general. There's a yearning, Africa, something crying inside, a river that flows and knows not where it goes. It forgot its source. Fog-covered mountains in the distance become insignificant. They become insignificant with distance. And the river cries. The river dries. And the river dies. We start again, Africa, and start to gain one another's trust and thrust into the future, leaving behind not our past. We start again, not at pains to forget the pain, but to remember, to remember we are tomorrow's children, not the children of yesteryear. Okay. Um, uh, thanks for joining us. Yeah, I was I was doing a poem. Um, this is called "We Start Again." Um, so I'm going to start again. <laughs> So we start again in Africa and start to gain one another's trust and thrust into the future, leaving behind not our past. We start again, not at pains to forget the pain, but to remember, to remember, we are tomorrow's children, not the children of yesteryear. I'll bait to pretend the pain, slavery, colonialism, dictatorship, inflicted. To pretend it never existed would be to inflict upon our fathers and mothers and their fathers' mothers a treachery of the worst kind. We start again, not as the slave driven, driven to hate. Not so much haughty as awakened, nor paranoid as enlightened. 
We start again, but again not afresh. Upon that which is gained, we build that which is lost. This drum has been for a while a drowning whale. Our seed, they have grown deaf to the beating, the humming and thumping of its charms. They salivate like dogs to a bell, to pretend drums from across the land that promise a lot of dogs dinner and make a lot of dogs dinner of what they promise. We start again, together and not apart. From apart from each other, we spill and scatter like dust to be stamped and, and trampled on and tossed back to stagnation, relegation of the past. We start again with peace and yes, with love and not war and hate. With courage, we start again with pride. Thank you. So, Very generous of you. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, you know, like I said, you know, I'm just going to chat away. <laughs> if you've got any questions, please do ask. Uh, you know, uh, we want to try and make this as, as informal as it is. Uh, excuse me for standing, really. I'm, I guess I'm used to performing standing, man, <laughs> sitting down. But uh, yeah, do feel free to ask any questions, uh, you know. So I was talking, kind of sharing about some of the people that have inspired me as, as a poet, you know, growing up. When I mentioned Dabuzo Marudu was here. Um, I would also like to mention Albert Nyati, for some you know, who may know him, I'm sure most of you know him, who is a Blue Oil based artist and I've had the honor of performing with him in, in, in Birmingham uh, when he, you know, he does come to the UK quite a bit to do some, um, some uh, yeah, performances. And I'm quite struck by one of his poems, which many people know, particularly this phrase, which is, I will not speak. Um, and that phrase in itself is very telling because when he says, I will not speak, he speaks volumes about many uh, people, many of our fellow citizens who are actually unable to speak sometimes, or sometimes pay a huge price for speaking. You know, so that poem by, uh, by Albert Nyati, I will not speak, I think, inspires, inspired a generation of poets, including myself, to actually perhaps have what I may call courage, but not necessarily always, but I think, you know, just to realize that we have a, a place in society and we have something to say and we can say it, so. Um, yeah, sure, go for it. I was, I was taken by the, the, your, the expression, again, not afresh. Mm. And the idea that we can't erase our history. Because I found myself in one of the classes here saying that we Africans have been so hurt by colonialism mm. that sometimes in our push to look into our history, you know, to have an Afrocentric perspective into African history, perhaps, it is a way to move away from that colonialism. It is a, because by all definitions, colonialism is, colonialism and post-colonialism is the fault line. It is the, the defining line of contemporary African history. But we are sort of <clears throat> trying to go back into looking into ancient kingdoms and looking into what we were before, perhaps in a way not to face the reality of the fact that, unfortunately, we have been colonized. Mm -hmm. And in 2016, I can't do anything about it, mm -hmm. except, like you said, building on what we have. Mm -hmm. And I was quite moved by the fact that we can't, we'll be doing a real, you said, treacherous thing to our yeah. fathers yeah. Yeah. by trying to deny that mm -hmm. part of our history. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah, very, very well articulated. Yeah, thank you. Uh, any more thoughts? If there are any more thoughts, um, and I'll move on to uh, the next so, piece. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, oh, sorry. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, go on. You don't have to yeah, raise um, it, just fire away. Yeah, yeah you're not looking. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, um, I'm just thinking, going back to history. Mm -hmm. I'm just thinking uh, in Mozambican historiography, uh, normally when they refer to poetry, music, mm. and other <coughs> cultural manifestations, they talk about non armed forms of contestation to colonial domination. Mm. So uh, bringing it back, I mean now, uh, in contemporary Africa, mm. and also Zimbabwe and Mozambique, how do you see uh, this poetry? 
Do you compare? Are there some changes, similarities between? Yeah, that's that's a very uh, good point and observation. Um, hardly an expert on how poetry has evolved, but I think in my experience and how I've seen Zimbabwe, I think poetry has broadened. I think it's, it's poetry is a, like a discipline has embraced other forms of um, you know. There's much more kind of uh, using poetry with other forms of art, like music, for example. I've got my poetry, which is recorded with music backing. Um, I've collaborated with choirs before, um, but also I think it's moved from being uh, the reserve in, in, in most instances of, of men, mostly, uh, to becoming much more broadly, you know, done by including women. We've got amazing Zimbabwean women poets in the Zimbabwe who address all sorts of issues, including political issues, as well as gender issues and things like that, uh, and racial issues. So I think it's become much more accessible and also probably a bit more demystified. This idea that if you're a poet, you have to walk around with hair as lovely as Simukai's. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's not you can actually be a poet and have your hair shaved like mine. <laughs> or, or you can change. <laughs> so, yeah, so, so in many ways, your typical poet is not that mysterious anymore. <laughs> So yeah, uh, so hopefully that actually makes poetry something that we can all take up because you know, I've challenged many people who would say, ah, wow, you know, you're a poet, I can write, in a, you know, I challenge them, write a poem, they see, you know, and, and once, when I started, I never saw myself as a poet. People would confer, say to me, you are a poet. I, I never, there never came a time where I, could, I thought of myself as a poet. But through interacting with people and engaging with people, they themselves thought, yeah, you know, <coughs> you are a poet and I thought okay maybe I am a poet so it's just about how we see ourselves and how we for me poetry is a platform that through which I you know I engage on issues that I care about already so mm -hmm. yeah okay uh, thank you for that uh, I'm going to do so um, <coughs> uh, to put one person on this spot I know you guys know know this uh, Simukai tell us about Aluta continue <laughs> 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 The struggle continues. The struggle continues. Yeah. So, you know, and, and where, where does that come from? Where, where was the <laughs> in a sentence or two? Well, I used to hear with uh, Samara Masha, yeah. the first president of Mozambique. Yeah. But certainly it doesn't come from him. I mean, he yeah. might have picked it from. Yeah. So, in many ways, it's become like a war cry, isn't it? You know, something, this idea that the struggle continues. And I think, you know, it's kind of reverberated even in today's um, kind of um, movements, if you, should, if you were to call them that. So I wrote this one called Aluta Continuo. So when I say Aluta, you, you indulge me by saying Continuo. So we're, we're going to try and be as animated as possible. <laughs> so, so, we can, uh, so Aluta Continuo. Okay, you're very animated. You? Aluta Continuo. Push me like a snake. Push me. Okay. Like a serpent entering your children's room. Stab me in the back with a dagger of words and sweep me like dust into a deep pity, into a deep pit of pity with the bristles of your broom. Tear me to pieces, I mean, really stamp on me like a rag on your doorstep. Then laugh and laugh and laugh in my face like a pack of hyenas snatching kill from a lone lioness. Aluta, continue. continue. Say to your friends with a voice pregnant with joy. She's lonely, like a toy outgrown by a child. A tatter of emotions. Laugh your lungs to explosion and fist, fist your heart to implosion with the painting of my heart. Look the sun square in the face with the gaze of a lover in a room full of suitors. The sun, I'm sure, the sun will reserve for you and you alone. And the moon, likewise, will oblige like it ought. For only you deserve that nightly, politely lake of luck. Do all this and then prepare, really prepare, like a Farmer sensing the coming of the rains. Prepare to be stunned by the storm 
that rises and rises like a wall. A looter. You see, each day you cause to fall, fed the storm of the spirit of a looter. Continue. Continue. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. I don't know how much time we have. I'm going to do um, one last one. And then hopefully we can open it up to discussion. So I'm just going to do one last one, which is not necessarily, this one is actually not in my book. So um, it's called Zimbabweans are singing again. You know, it's a, it's a poem that I wrote when Zimbabwe was going through really tough times. And, and sometimes it's tough to look at what's happening. Shel shelves are empty without food and things, things like that. And then you think, you know, where, where is this going for our country? But um, what struck me around that time is how Zimbabweans were running in the streets actually singing. You know, singing well, for, wasn't just a tool of um, protest in a sense. But it was also something that said, yeah, we, we remain hopeful. You know, it, said, it spoke of a future that they dreamt of. Zimbabweans are singing again. The dust settled, the unsettled, fettled, kettle on the boil, ready for boys heading home the kettle, embattled nettle biting warriors, nomadic coming home, homecomers, women inside, ululating. Who can ululate here? <laughs> oh, there you go, wonderful. <laughs> Men returning from Dari. Cold fending children in a child. And the drifter with a goat, smoking chalice, stroking his beard. And neighbors who think he's weird, the ones who never feared, who cheer. Water, motoring tummies of nannies, sweating for very little. And little boys and girls and the kings, lining for Stuart Little. And the ones pining, <laughs> keen to make a lot. The grotto lot, the go to a lot of trouble to win the lotto lot. Hello, motto, the bubble, the ones living inside it untroubled. Mashona, Devele, Warungu, Manika. The lot for whom it is cool to say, I Zakanzanya Baba. The older lot. To them, cool is cold. Nanga ma profita. Payroll people and people on the payroll. Inflatable things on rapturous things and the trouble ensuing if they rapture. Matobe, Matamba, Makwakwa, Magwajawa. Do you think you know what all those are? What are they? They are groups of people. Groups of fruits. <laughs> <laughs> Makepe Kepe one, Dynamos two. That's groups of people. Those are football teams as well. <laughs> But good guess. Amashola nyama, ema gumeni, iboso. The tempo by Baba Dembo. Dembo is a Zimbabwean musician. Most of you may know him. Tururu, Tururu. That's Tuku, another Zimbabwean musician. Is that Tembo Brothers? No, Tembo Brothers, I think that was a group, wasn't it? Tembo Brothers. Yeah. That was a group, yeah. That's Leonard Dembo, yeah. Yeah, so Dembo, Leonard Dembo. Tururu, that's Mtuku. Zimbabweans are singing again. Thank you. Thank you so much. That can lead us to a discussion. <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah. Merci. Yeah, sure. Yeah. You pass it around. Yeah. So no one is in charge at this stage. No. <laughs> Anyone may just jump in. Aluta, continue. <laughs> yes, I, I appreciate. The, in fact, your efforts it, it, it's so lively to me, and I'm not sure I'm that creative to come up with uh, some of those nice, nice terms that you brought. But uh, of course, thank God we have uh, people from development studies or international development here. I'm going back to your first point, which which says that uh, we should start again, but not from the scratch. Mm. I always like to get specificities to how Africa starts again, but mm. not from the scratch. Mm. Politically, what specific things do we need to engineer 
So see only what are the specificities that we should put on the existing structure. Economically, what are the specific issues mm -hmm. that we should put on the existing foundation if we are not starting again? So, I mean, I'm just throwing this to, to mm. the whole group. Yeah. yeah, this is for you yeah. experts. <laughs> 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 so, from an economic perspective, yeah. Yeah. what are some of the things that we should do if we are not starting from the scratch? Yeah, what, what are your thoughts? Uh, of course, I have very less. I am I'm just a pessimist, but then uh, <laughs> I am coming from a conflict and governance perspective. Mm. So if you ask me, for instance, I've always advocated for uh, homegrown policies when it comes to conflict management mm. and conflict resolution. Mm. My observation, and also from the literature, is that uh, most of the conflict resolution issues, and I'm sure Francois will bear with me, they are coming from outside bodies. And I think it's simply because they have the leverage. The resources are there. France does not consult Mali when, they are, when it is sending troops to, to Mali. When something happens there and there was the, there's a need to intervene. <coughs> the AU is there trying to I mean, chart a way in order to intervene in Mali. But then AU or France, AU and or France just brings in troops. So that domestication of policies when it comes to conflicts <coughs> on the continent, I think it should be something that should be taken seriously. That is my observation from a conflict perspective. Mm. But then I've, I've always wanted to look for the political aspects, the economic aspects. How should we tackle some of these things on the continent? Maybe I'm digressing because this is Southern African group, but then we have to widen <laughs> Continental uh, uh, issue. Can I comment? Yeah. Okay. This this is a Southern African discussion, <laughs> but these yeah. issues are also in our country. Oh, okay. uh, Kenya shares a lot with Zimbabwe, mm -hmm. not in terms of the leadership. And even Ghana says more because Mugabe is our enemy. <laughs> 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 That's true. <laughs> but, but in terms of uh, the situation, the historical situation of we share a lot. Mm. So uh, these are former settler colonies, especially issues of land are uh, very, very sensitive there. Yeah. Mm. And just any other uh, typical African country. So mm. these things are of relevance also to West Africa. Mm. But uh, in in context, uh, in the context of what you are saying, mm. uh, I don't really agree that we, Africa exclusively has policies from outside being imposed on us. Mm. I think we should start shifting from that idea. We, mm. we need also to appreciate that our locals, our local leaders, mm. uh, policy makers, and leaders generally, also have a lot of say. And in fact, I think they have a greater say mm. than outsiders. Mm. The only thing that makes us a little bit maybe twist is that we don't have the resources as you're saying. So that someone may be bringing you these resources to implement our particular thing and they want to maybe shift the way you're going to uh, do whatever you wanted to do. But they don't really impose it the way you think. Mm -hmm. This is not the era of Cold War. In the Cold War era, we compared because there was a possibility that you could be overthrown. Mm -hmm. It just wants how much you got to But I don't, I don't really think that this happens. I want to give you a case. There's a, you may know, you guys know Professor Nyanyo. He's, he's one of the leading Marxist uh, scholars in, in Africa, uh, alongside Samir Amin and others. And uh, Nyang Nyongo, he taught me in my master's classes in political economy. And uh, with this good background in political economy, he is very smart mm -hmm. to know what is wrong for his country and what is not. So these are time, I think in the Grand Coalition government, when the IMF yeah. wanted to impose some things on Kenya. And he was a minister for economic planning. And he just refused. And there's nothing these people would do. So just told them, I think if we do this, it will be maybe to your advantage, you're the one who's going to gain. But if you don't, if we do it this other way, this is when it is going to help my country. <coughs> At least I want it done this way. So that just tells you that there are cases where we can actually refuse to allow an outside uh, policy oriented maybe to, to be imposed on us. So we should not really have but then what is the scope of said ability to say no. It is there, I believe. Maybe if you don't want to use it. 
but it is there. I think the thing that is affecting us so much is we want to be rented, and uh, this now affects you because if you are being rented, you know you won't question. Mm -hmm. So you just be given your dues and then you keep quiet. But I really think this is a, 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 a digression, of course. But I really don't like this. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like this mentality that we have that putting it up being on, in post on Africa from outside. It is really not a yeah. issue. I it's think it should be tackled from outside. It, it is of course from within. It's from Africa. So whatever be the case, it, it most of the strength is coming from outside. That is my observation. So whether you sit and plan with them, you tell them this is what you have. If you go through why AU is not able to solve the situation in Sudan or Somalia, you would actually find out that they are not able to push through with their homegrown policies that they have. Have you so read? Uh, have you read? Why? What? Yeah. Is this the open poetry? Is this what poetry does? <laughs> Yeah. Okay, back to point actually. <laughs> back to point. Yeah, I was just attacking my <laughs> and my yeah. classmates too. So back to poetry. Uh, there's a point you are making that uh, you use poetry to express yourself, uh, yourself on things that bother you. So like the situation in Zimbabwe, I can take in this case, is something that bothers you as a, as a national of that country who lives outside. I don't want to believe you. You're living outside you're in exile. I think you're just living here voluntarily. That would make you to come here. But then, my, 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 my concern is this. Who takes up this poetry to really influence them back home there? Mm. Because, okay, Zimbabwe is one of these countries with very high literacy, literacy rates. Mm. But is the local really reading this poetry so that you can say it is something that has influence back there? Or it is just for the elites? Uh, like my friend here, and uh, this one, I don't know who else is from there. That's a very good question. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> can I, can I go, go on, please, yeah, please, please go for it. Yeah, because yeah, I think there's, there's a kind of an interesting like um, <laughs> flip side to that. Okay. Um, so, like, one of my favorite uh, hip hop artists is a British political MC um, called Akala, and he's, he's got this wonderful line where he says, How arrogant to think that we can change the world through art, but only slightly less arrogant than those who think that we can't. Um, <laughs> And then kind of what he's getting at is, is fine, we may be not looking at change um, in this kind of substantial structural uh, sense of the term, but, 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 but poetry, expression, art, aesthetics and so forth uh, form an important kind of cognitive frame of vocabulary, a way in which human beings negotiate their way through the world kind of thing. So I guess my, my question is, um, I'd be interested in knowing a little bit more about um, how you have used your poetry to engage with kind of mm. social questions, mm. especially given the titles mm. uses of politics, you know, mm. and, and what kind of uh, milieus and, uh, and environments uh, are you operating in within which you, mm. you kind of share mm. um, your self-expression? Very good questions both. Uh, let, let me start with yours, which is about, you know, is poetry, say, in the context of Zimbabwe, um, for the elites. Um, Actually, in, in Zimbabwe, there has been a lot of communities which have emerged in uh, not only in the urban areas, but also in the rural areas where, where poetry has been shared. And I know of several in Zimbabwe growth points, for example, where poets have actually gathered and shared poetry. And also they've traveled. It's become a, a link, in a sense, between the urban and rural. So in Arari, one most known was um, uh, the Book Cafe, mm -hmm. um, where... Fun? So it did close down, um, but actually before it closed down, again it closed down because of some of these structural issues we're talking about. Not only that, but I think also because actually it was also beginning to be seen as a threat, um, you know, to some to the powers that be, which in in, in a sense to me actually reveals something about art as something that you know, as Sumik Bukai said, you know, can actually be um, both a platform as well as part of a language, you know, in terms of how we express ourselves. Um, the book cafe, by the way, did also come to London at some point. Um, you know, I was lucky to be one of the performers. They were, you know, it was now linking p people back home as well as the diaspora. Um, now, to, to your question, Simukai, which is about what kind of environments we, you know, if, if, if I've been perhaps born and uh, using poetry, not, like you said, not necessarily, you know, it's not about changing the world as you would with the arm and knocking and things and things take a different form. I don't think that's how we, we you know, 
that's certainly not what I set out to do. But I'm, but I'm, having started someone who actually did not set out to to want to be an activist and secondly to be a poet. I mean, the, one the very first event where I went to perform was at a conference where actually there were a lot of uh, some of our government ministers and um, and such like, and I did a poem which was talking about how you know the country has kind of pushed its children away. So I used this metaphor of a of a hen. A hen protects its, its kind of chicks, and suddenly this hen is pushing its chicks away, you know, and using that kind of uh, contradiction. Um, but beyond that, I've also used poet in, in, in some very, I would say, um, humble, the word humble almost sounds arrogant too, but in some, you know, for the lack of a better word, humble settings in, in, in schools, for example, you know, I use poetry to teach children about um, cultures that they may not be ordinarily exposed to, you know, particularly in Britain, where, where you know, I teach them about life in Ross, Zimbabwe, and things like that. But um, beyond those humble settings, which I actually enjoy very much, I've also been lucky to be invited, say, to the United Nations, where I've used poetry to, to speak about issues of child rights, um, for instance, child sexual abuse in the context of, of Zimbabwe. So th those are just, it's just a kind of snapshot of um, how poetry can be used in a very pragmatic sense to address some of the issues, but not necessarily like a hammer, knocking things out and giving them a different shape, but just in the sense of a conversational way, yes. Yeah, just to add on, because um, um, I think it's important to also, because you see there's not so much published out of Zim mm -hmm. in terms of poetry or anything, and that's a huge problem of public publication mm -hmm. in Sub-Saharan Africa generally, that there's not enough coming uh, out and there's not enough money and everything. Mm -hmm. But then uh, there's a tendency to sort of look at that uh, small amount of of books coming out and then say there's not there's not a literary community and then forgetting about the whole oral uh, side of things uh, which I think poetry is a big part in in Zim to like sort of bring people in and to in part of a wider tradition which is very much alive even though it's not on paper and it's not some like measurable um, it's still there and it still has that influence in humble conditions as you say so isn't it interesting that you, you can always tell someone who's either been to Zimbabwe or has interacted with Zimbabwe <laughs> some they call it Zim, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know. yeah, very good point. I had a question actually about yeah. um, language yeah. in your writing. Um, have you thought about that a lot? Because we have these conversations, yeah. at least in our course, about you know, not using English and French. Mm. 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 Yeah, so I'm, I'm not yet at, um, at is it Ngugi's level <laughs> from, from, yeah, from not, not using English completely to uh, using his native language. Um, yeah, as you notice, my last piece is, is about with the singer again, does he have um, quite, you know, kind of a, you know, boring, not borrowing, you know, but using English. Uh, using Shona, using Debele. Yeah. I'm, I'm lucky in that I can speak three those languages. I can speak Debele, I can speak Shona, you know, I can also, of course, speak English. So, you know, I'm, I'm, some of my pieces do have, I've got pieces which are in Debele completely or Shona completely. Oh. Um, but also, I like to kind of, you know, mix them, you know, to, yeah. to speak to the, yeah, um, to speak to audiences as, as, as much, as many as I can, really. Yeah. yeah, and also, I mean, like in South Africa, people don't speak one language. No, they also. don't, yeah. Spend yeah. most of your days speaking three or four languages at once. That's ones. true, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that's a new way of... Of talking. I mean, it is. I mean, I mean, Gugi actually mentioned Gugi. Gugi is to be mentioned this idea that languages speak to each other. It's interesting. I mean, uh, that example South Africa you gave up, you know, you, you see a South African, one speaking in Zulu, one in Kosa, but actually talking to each other, you know. Um, so it's kind of this idea of languages speaking to each other is, is a very interesting one. It's an idea by Gugi as well. Uh, I have a question for you hmm. regarding that. <coughs> Do you do you do you hope to one way one day win the Nobel Prize? <laughs> <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> and if you do, and if you do, will, will you be concerned by you writing some of your points? Maybe I don't know if you written some and published because the one I think that one is English exclusively. But will you be concerned that if you are writing and publishing some of your poems in <coughs> your mother tongue mm. and also coming away from just being a poet mm. to also being a literary critic like Ngugi. 
and expressing your opinions on whether, though you've not expressed this off record, expressing your opinions on whether you prefer Africans to write in their mother tongue or not. Mm. Do you think they would jeopardize, jeopardize your hopes of catching that prize? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, looking at the last few years, it seems to me to even think about you know, both this prize, you have to have started a war at least, yeah, which I don't have capacity to do. So, <laughs> so, no, so that's not certainly not my uh, ambition. <laughs> uh, but the, the, what, the other question, in my view, the more serious question about um, do I think Africans should or should not use whatever language? Um, you know, I don't think it's my place to, to be prescriptive about what people should or should not do. Um, I do, I'm, like I said, I see it as a, you know, as a blessing, actually, the fact that I can speak Ndebel and Shona and English. I can go to my Ndebel and then feel very much at home. I can go to my Shona and then feel very much at home. Equally, I can live in Europe, you know, and interact with people and go in schools and work with children and still contribute something. Um, so, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm not very, you know, I don't, I'm not very precious about um, about about these issues of um, you know kind of uh, this is my culture, this is my language. I should hold on to it and you know be defensive about it. Uh, uh, in in a sense, I see language in a very pragmatic view. I think it's you know if, if it fails to connect us, then what's the point? You know. Exactly. Um, so as long as people can languages can talk to each other and people can talk to each other, um, I think that's a good thing. Yeah, yeah like you see, when in this setting, most of us are Africans here, right? But which language can we use to converse here? Maybe me and uh, Mata may want to speak in Swahili, which mm. no one else here will understand. Mm. So how, how is this how going? Yeah. Oh, you will. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> Maybe not you will. So you see, yeah. if you start speaking, speaking uh, Shona or Nepali, I won't understand it. Mm. So I really have problems with this. Mm. That's not to say I'm not aware of the politics behind language. Mm. So I think that <coughs> politics images when when there's this view that one language is more superior than another and but by the way this is not just a, a western and african thing or global south and global north yeah, it is also in, 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 in zimbabwe we yeah, exp yeah. experience it as well yeah, between yeah. you know say shona and Debele, where one group may feel that they should, their culture or their language should be more privileged it's, it's, for me i think the problem is about hierarchization of one culture or one language over another but w where people are conversing and interacting and being respectful of each other i think that's a good thing yeah, and, uh, maybe I think we are becoming a global world and of course every organization comes with uh, links. Mm. So do me you could do your, your, your poetry in English or in a local language, but then you would have somebody else in Western Africa mm. with a dominant local language who could partner with you mm. and mm. translate that into their own uh, yeah. Uh -huh. mm. So it, I'm not sure it is the, the, the matter of trying to know all other languages around you, mm. but then if you could partner with other people, locals or people in different regions or different countries, the, it's just a matter of translating mm. into mm. different languages. The mm. performance spirit will be in you, of course. Mm. Mm. If you go there to perform, you can perform in any other language, mm. but then the mm. translation is there. Mm. So I think it's a matter of linking with the people from the, if you go online, they, there are even jobs for people to translate articles into Arabic, into Swahili and things like that. So mm -hmm. I think it's a matter of mm -hmm. maybe linking with people from different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. I'm curious as to what kind of feedback you've received from your, the, the poetry that yeah. you write. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in many ways, I've, 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 I think I've been very lucky that um, I've had a very, without, and I don't mean this by trying to say, you know, in a pretentious way. I, I mean this genuinely in a, in a, in, in the sense that a, a, a global um, audience is seems to have engaged with my poetry. So, you know, f for example, when on my website I've had people from, uh, which is not running anymore, <laughs> by the way, but I had people, you know, writing from India, from different parts of the world, you know, uh, and, and from rural parts of, you know, say um, uh, some African countries, you know, say, so in, in a sense for me that actually is a humbling fact that, you know, you're speaking not only to one group of people, uh, even if I didn't intend for that to be the case, but maybe because mm -hmm. some of the themes that I kind of um, focus on are things that people can relate with and in, in that sense, um, yeah, they, they kind of view the poetry as being relevant to them as well. So, yeah, yeah.
So, well, one of the questions I had, and it relates to, um, I guess, part of the discussion that was begun at the African Studies Centre at the um, or African Studies uh, seminar in the first week mm -hmm. about this um, idea of decolonizing knowledge and mm -hmm. epistemologies and what have you. Um, but kind of one of the suggestions, one of the questions or issues that was raised was about the ways in which within the social sciences specifically we think about and engage with uh, poetry and fiction beyond beyond tokenism, you know, beyond sort of saying that here is an appendix, we're going to bring in a spoken word, um, artists, we've done that, let's get down to the, the political economy. Kind of yes, 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 um, yes. So I guess I, I, I'm, I'm curious to know from yourself and, 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 and from your yeah. colleagues, of course, I mean, doing the MSc course at the moment, uh, which is, of course, constituted by history, politics and anthropology, how you kind of, like, you know, navigate that and whether you think there is a greater role. For, for fiction, whether it adds something kind of qualitatively and analytically um, kind of different or new um, that might be harder to get at through, say, by art. Um, let my colleagues dive in. Give <laughs> 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 me a nice escape from that. Francois, what do you think? Thank you, Martha. Um, I think um, that is an untapped source of knowledge in not just Sub-Saharan Africa, but I think worldwide. Uh, we have seen an increase and a very dom a domination of quantitative sources of knowledge mm -hmm. and quantitative forms of understanding what is in the world. So we are mostly going towards codifying everything. We want everything to be one, zero, one, zero, a binary of things that we can easily compute and then have a fancy equation that would give us an answer, whether that answer is right or not. That is where we have it wrong, and that is where the sciences, the, the, we call them soft sciences, but that is where the other side of these things, poetry, music, all sorts of arts, drawing, paintings, come in. And they balance, in my opinion, they balance these perspectives or they sort of keep us in check whenever we are going overboard. And you do make a, a good point in saying that a lot of times we invite a token to be the musical interlude between discussions and usually in an event that is the, the section where people go and have coffee and you only attend if you are the friend of the person before <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. That is not right. I don't think that is right. But is it in a way because uh, artists, I want to say they don't try to do things the way in a way that actually falls into the general discussion. I think, is it because artists are trying so hard to demarcate themselves and be artists? I want to be a musician, so I'm going to do it the musical way. Or I'm going to be a poet, I'm going to do it the poet way. And then you have uh, people of the hard sciences also pushing for a hard methodology towards things. And then you, you always have this divide existing between them. It's because of these attitudes that we see this thing happening. Or is it because, generally, I'm sorry, I'm bringing an, another question. <laughs> or is it gen because there's a genuine divide between the two mm. methods or disciplines? I am sorry. I, 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 told, I, told, I, told, I was thinking before as well that there's this sort of, there's so much resistance towards seeing fiction of any kind as mm. serious knowledge, you mm. know, mm. Uh, mm. both here and internally. In, mm. in, Africa, it's like it's just like a token thing. But which is when when you think about that, that's quite wrong because I think about like half of what makes me forms my understanding of the world comes from fiction of some sort. You know, mm -hmm. everything together, mm -hmm. series and, mm -hmm. <laughs> and the you know, music, everything like that. That also very much forms your outlook on the world. Mm -hmm. And then you have to ask the question: Who's producing that material? Mm -hmm. um, and why and everything, mm -hmm. but still not taken seriously as as a mm -hmm. as a source of of uh, of knowledge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, so to, I'm sorry to come back in. I was mm -hmm. reading today, and there's something mentioned radio trottoir in French, 
and that is pavement roads. Uh, no, pavement radios, rather. Okay. And it's the idea that there is a certain type of press information that is hard, that is whatever is printed, whatever is written, whatever is in a newspaper, that is what is believable. And then you have radio trottoirs, that is dodgy types of information, which we call in English rumors. And you have this divide between the two. But we have gone so hard into, deli into <coughs> demarcating them, into separating them, that we are failing to see how radio trottoirs can be actually sources of knowledge of, mm -hmm. or of information to the populations or to the people. So. Mm -hmm. uh, Maybe I could just say one thing, and I, mean, I think you can have an academic debate about those divides, but if we want to talk about politics mm -hmm. and poetry, we can't stop if we think just poetry is something subversive. Um, you know, it's not just the book cafe that's using mm. poetry. Mm. I mean, the NPF no. is a major producer oh. of culture. Yeah. <laughs> it know? is. Yeah. We need to think about mm. power and poetry on, mm. you know, mm. in a, a repressive register mm. rather mm. than just a mm. subversive one. Uh, that's true. Um, and then it starts looking quite different. You know, it's not this beautiful flowery side of mm. things. Um, and look at how radio has been used to mobilize to do the most horrific of things, you know, famously in Rwanda. Um, and rumor, of course, is absolutely essential to mobilizing precisely for those sorts of purposes. So, you know, yeah, they're the kind of airy-fairy end of it, but they're also the most menacing of all. You know, it's sort of a, a scary combination. Yeah, it's interesting that the Zanupia, for example, if you go to their, um, their rallies, you know, they sponsor musicians exactly. and all, all the public all the musicians. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, yes. I have a comment mm -hmm. regarding this debate. I always regard them as shallow people. Mm -hmm. Those who want to think that what is recorded in uh, what we traditionally refer to as literature, that is poetry, uh, uh, novels, plays, is not serious scholarship. That is very shallow of them. If you are really a serious scholar, there's a lot to learn or get from these things. If you content analyze this, these things, you get a lot. Mm. And a novelist, for example, is writing about his contemporary society. He may, he or she may draw on history, but likely you find them just trying to describe what is happening within their setting. And if you are a political scientist, for example, and you're writing uh, on something that touches on that society, you can get to learn something from that. And the serious scholars really appreciate this in political science which is my background, there's a US scholar called Harry Eckstein. Harry Eckstein really, really emphasizes on those who study comparative politics to draw on the works of novelists to get information back up whatever they're saying. If you are doing political economy, how will you understand capitalism if you can't read Richard uh, to by Shakespeare? Mm. It won't make, make any sense. So really, these things, and as she's saying, they should be included <coughs> Even for African studies that we study here, or even for international development, <laughs> we should have these works included in our bibliography, mm -hmm. in, 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 our, in our reading lists. It is very, very important by the way, and in fact, that is something that we are not taught about seriously. Maybe we should recommend it. It is very, very important. Yeah. I mean, you, you have historians, surely there is. Yeah, virtually. I mean, I mean all I historians see. write about this kind of stuff. Mm. We're very sophisticated people. <laughs> 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 I mean, there's, there's a brilliant work on, you know, Power in the Praise Poem, for example. Well, yeah. You know, it's just a wonderful whole series, a whole collection around culture, um, around Mozambique. Um, yes. Yeah, it's fantastic stuff. If and Mike White is a poet, too. Mm. <laughs> They've tried to push in uh, a little bit of it, what they call the literature, African literature or something, is part of the optional papers. But then it's not something most of us would opt for because of maybe the, 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 the training that we've had concerning uh, poetry or literature on Africa. Growing up as, as a child in my primary school, we, we were asked to do some craft work, to do some poetry, Every week we had to do all these things, but then when we got to secondary school, all these things vanished. And mm. we were reading economics, history, geography, science, mm. and things like that. But what my perspective is more of the, the way we view the world today. Your son is in school, your, your daughter is in school, and all you are thinking is that he should be a professional, he or she should be a professional. 
you cannot go home and tell your mother that I want to be a musician and she will be very comfortable. Unless you see people <laughs> performing and bringing money home, that's the time they might accept you as a musician. But you cannot tell them that this is who I want to be. Mm. So it is our, the way we commodify the, the, the world, the, the way we try to make economies out of everything. I think that is why we, we, we are losing out of the, one of the most creative aspects of life. Mm. This is how I view it. Yeah. Uh, just to bring up uh, maybe a slightly more uncomfortable uh, side of like African authorship, this uh, I think there's internally a bit of resistance to the Westernization of authors, or that literature in the written novel form is a Western format, for example, combined with people who go to, uh, for example, the sake Binyamanga Wainaina. That coming out of the closet, I mean, it's, people don't react to that in the same. Mm. Mm. Do you think? Do you, do you agree with me that maybe there is some resistance to, or, or that people will say things like, uh, "No, the reading of a novel like this is that's not that's not what we do. That's mm. that's something important, you know." Some some people make that argument sometimes, and then you come with your now Western ideas of gayness or whatever, and you bring it back here <laughs> and. Mm. I'm, I'm good friends with Bill, with B, B, okay, for example. And so, um, kind of, are you aware uh, that you will move dying? It's almost dying. Dying. I, I, I don't know. I'm not aware of it. No. I don't mean that it's dying. Yeah. All right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, you know, I think he's a very courageous uh, person, in my view. Um, you know, and why do I call him courageous? Because he's, he's stood for what he believes, you know. he's. Uh, despite the backlash, and you know, and this is, I'm, I'm, I'm sure it's, it's not been easy. Um, but I'll, for me, you know, for example, when I when I set out, when when I thought, okay, um, so I've always been very passionate about politics. So I kind of see myself as a political activist or commentator first before poet. So in a sense, for me, poetry is something that enables me to do those things that I always cared about. In a sense. So, but when I set out to, to try and kind of push my poetry further in terms of, you know, u using it in some of the things that I was doing, um, I was very aware of how it was perceived in my own community. So, for, for instance, some of the comments I would get from my fellow countrymen was, well, you know, how, how can you... How can you be a professional? If you've ever heard of a professional poet, mm -hmm. they'll, they'll laugh in your face that that idea is, is too stupid, you know? Mm -hmm. So, in a sense, I had a strategy. I knew that if I wanted... Um, even my community to take my poetry seriously, I had to take it somewhere else first, almost like triangulation. Mm -hmm. So I had to take my poetry away from my community. And then when my community saw that my poetry was accepted, then they started accepting me now. Mm -hmm. you know, and then so now you started having these people inviting you to say, oh, can you come up with this event? Can you? But however, the, the conflict was, I don't see myself as an entertainment uh, poet at all. <laughs> at all. <laughs> so they'll say, oh, can you come and do a bit of poetry? I've got an event. You know, this idea of uh, when we're a big board, <laughs> you can <laughs> you know, I, I do like my poetry to be engaging, but I, I don't see it as entertaining. I don't intend it to be entertaining. So there are those things. I think it's things that one is always going to have to kind of navigate. Um, not necessarily kind of, I, don't, I see it as conflict, but I see conflict as opportunity. I don't see conflict as necessarily a bad thing always, you know. So you know, within that conflict, there are opportunities to educate people, which is why I'm interested in doing workshops in schools, because sometimes it's, you know, starting with the younger ones that, you know, maybe ideas may change in the future or not. Well, I mean, what you're saying also is a, there's a very different thing to, to, okay, we're having a party now in your community, yeah, yeah, can you yeah. please come and do, because yeah. you happen to be really good at, uh, you know, engaging audiences and, and, uh, and seeing for entertainment, not for work, not for reading, literacy is, is, is a whole other bag of stuff. So it's the, the issue of, of form. I mean, I think it's it's quite there's a it's a side of tension. Just I agree with you. How you consume yeah. the content, the material, you know. Mm. Yeah, but I don't know whether it's helpful to continue seeing uh, these things, like you know, you know, because sometimes I think in in in, in some Africanist, I don't like to say Africanist thinking, but in some Africanist disciplines. Um, again, I'm not an expert in these things, but I'll just give my view nonetheless. I, I, I suspect sometimes they, there is a tendency to kind of view certain things as, okay, so they're Western, so therefore we're going to shun them. 
um, and we're just going to stick to this which we think is African. But actually, in, in so doing, we can become so defensive that we f fail and forget to sell what is actually perhaps essentially African, but also beneficial to everyone, including West. For example, I'll give you an example. I, I, I went to Bosnia uh, for, for an international conference where I ran workshops on Ubuntu. I mean, the enthusiasm for, for that cultural aspect, which in our communities we take for granted because Ubuntu is something that you grow up just hearing. But the fact that it was put in a, in a way that people could, could you know, almost conceptualize as, 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 as an idea that, through which they could understand even their everyday struggles and other issues was quite exciting for them. So I, I, I guess my point is, in being defensive, we can miss not only what we can offer the world, you know, but also perhaps even what we can gain from others. Um, so we've got a lot to offer, I think, but if we were to offer those things, I think we also have to be open to receiving as well. Yeah. So, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm not, I'm not the, mo the moderator here, so just fire away. <laughs> <laughs> just fire away, sorry. Um, you mentioned that you are uh, a political activist and then a poet mm. and you are blurring the lines mm. sort of mm. and i want to and i'm i want to wonder i'm wondering mm. uh whether that's good or whether that's mm. a, a fair way of doing things mm. because isn't what makes poetry or this isn't what makes art mm. the fact that an artist remains an artist mm. isn't what makes good music good music mm. i mean the moment I know that there are artists who now become political activists and then their music just ends up being rubbish or their art ends up being not interesting because they are trying so hard to make a point, to be engaged in the situation. I mean, how do you balance, yeah, how do you do that, yeah, the, the, the blurring of the lines? Yeah, it's, for, for me, I don't like to exist in a box, you know, because food, I, I do several things, right? I write children's stories, um, you know, I write, I write, I engage with political issues through my blog where I write near academic work as well as academic work as well as creative forms of work. So I, I, I hate to exist in a box. So maybe that's just my restless nature. I don't like to be, you know, for people to view me, to say, well, you're a poet and that's it, stay in your corner. I really don't like that. Um, so maybe it's always going to be a, a, a continuous conflict because even when I'm, when I'm writing my, uh, you know, bi bibliography or CV, you know, I, I, I find I have to re-edit and edit, you know, do I put poet, uh, children's author and this thing? I, I feel like I can't necessarily classify myself as one, as one of those and that's it, you know. Um, so often, if I could actually just sum up everything, I'll just say citizen, you know, period. <laughs> Who happens to do these other things, you know. But I, I take a point in terms of, um, you know, because we live in a society where disciplines have to be disciplines. You know, if you're a poet, you have to be necessarily viewed as a poet. Or the poet has come to town. I get that. Um, it, that that's its, its advantages. So my approach here also is its disadvantages in a sense because, you know, in a sense you're not seen as an expert, perhaps. You know, but for me, I would rather lose that that are not being seen as an expert poet per se, uh, but still be able to have the freedom to engage using the various platforms. So, Last yeah. wish from me. Oh. We're going to have to leave. Sorry. <laughs> oh, you, you so really why don't we take one last round? Uh, please. And then yeah. You haven't had a chance to talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then, uh, <laughs> a bit off topic now. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking of when we were talking about um, uh, criticizing the Western forms of knowledge production. Mm. And I think obviously it's um, it's very important to do so. And it struck me, I was just reading about the history of international relations, a little review article I read in the RV of the weekend mm. about a book by Robert Vitalis. He writes it called White World Order, Black Power Politics, The Birth of American International Relations. And it's essentially about the the um, how the discipline of international relations as we understand again, a very sort of readers heart in American mm. world, you'll see all these you know, students, journals and so forth, is rooted in a very racist understanding of the world and the very troubling sort of uh, genesis of that discipline. Um, and I was thinking that this sort of reminded me of that, but it ties into this as well. Um, your point on the um, how people gloss over history in terms of the colonial history or its implications or its resonances. I was trying to, I was thinking this quite as rattling around my head because we talked about CC1 earlier from last year. And there's this, this colonial parenthesis, which is in the Please don't do that to us. <laughs> <laughs> Why won't you do that? Okay. <laughs> but, I think, but it's a really good point, and it's how discourse or how how discourse is reified and how knowledge 
some knowledge mm. is privileged above others in some forms of expression. And I mm. think that ties very much into what we're talking about mm. here and now, in that if you want to challenge um, vestiges of colonialism in the curriculum, things mm. like that, then it's very important not to neglect these aspects of knowledge. Mm. And it's so easy, especially in somewhere like Oxford, to subconsciously end up um, reciting old mantras and old creeds, even or uncritically accept what is just passed on to you, you know, mm. whether it be an old, old syllabi or so on and so yeah. forth. And I think coming at it, looking at forms of cultural production which directly challenge that, uh, can be really a rich and informative sort of strain and the same, like in the oral term, social term in history. Mm. So I guess it's kind of a long meandering way of trying to get points in that stuff. <laughs> that was very yeah. interesting. No, no, it's a really good way, yeah. But, yeah, yeah. I, I wondered if you were going to take poetry um, in terms of um, maybe as a mode of historical inquiry forward, maybe in any work that you're looking to produce this year? Oh, that's interesting, but I actually did it in a sense in my previous uh, uh, dissertation. So when I, when, when I, um, my, so my dissertation for my uh, bachelor's um, looked at the role of storytelling um, in, in, in child rights advocacy. So how that gives, um, restores children's autonomy, um, you know, so this idea that children are silenced by culture, by, by you know, what you may call adultism in society and things like that. But how does poetry... So I was looking at, you know, in that instance I used action research, looking at some of those workshops which I was running in schools, how children themselves and, and their educators viewed those as, you know, looking at their feedback, how do they think they kind of empower children to explore some of these concepts of human rights and things like that. So, um, yeah, moving forward, like you're saying, you know, probably not in the context of, uh, of um, the dissertation I'm going to do for my master's. I've got my, uh, my uh, supervisor just to my left <laughs> listening. <laughs> so, <laughs> be careful. <laughs> but, um, yeah, but who, who knows? In, in the future, you know, I'm always kind of interested to, to kind of draw from, you know, the, the, the creative side of things to see how that helps us to kind of, you know, um, this idea of seeing academic, in many ways it's a conflict that I had to deal with even coming to academics. I did, for a long time I didn't want to come into academics because I felt like uh, coming to academics meant I had to give up something. I had to give up the creative side of things. So, but I've kind of been pleasantly surprised that actually you are able to kind of merge the two sometimes. Yeah. You should do something about <laughs> political culture. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it was so interesting that you know, you, you invoke kind of so, the continuum um, and get us to kind of go back and forth. Yeah, and of course, yeah. it takes me back to reading, you know, the whole history of the Mozambican revolution. Mm, um, mm, but those things come from all over the planet. You know, they're so mm, fascinating to mm, trace. And mm, these guys are bored to death with this story. But do you know where the toy <laughs> toy comes from? The? the toy toy. Oh, the toy toy. Well, I know the toy toy, but no, no, I don't know quite where it comes from now. Algeria. Really? Yeah. What? Oh, that's news to me. <laughs> Al Toy Toy is Arabic. Oh, wow. Um, and so the first group who were trained in Algeria from the Southern African Liberation Movement were, it was a training chant, Toy Toy. Oh, wow. Um, and it has a whole longer Arabic thing that continues after that. Oh, really? Um, wow. Um, but it got reduced to Toy Toy. Um, oh. And then it was, it was picked up by the Zimbabwean guerrilla movement, yeah. um, Zapu. And then it was used in the Zapu camps in Zambia, and MK picked it up from Zebra. Oh, wow. Um, and then it got from MK in exile into the UDF and various groups in South Africa and became emblematic of the South African, you know, township oh. struggles of the 80s. But it comes from military training in Algeria in the early wow, 60s. Wow, that's fascinating. I've been, I've, so, I've been I mean, teaching children can... about toy toy coming from this originally. Yeah. So, because, yeah. so I've just lived that I'm not an authority in Zimbabwe history. I mean, it's, 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 about the political connections and the cultural and the linguistic and everything and how it circulates moving between camps. Wow. Um, it also has a whole life in the Tanzanian camps. Mm, you know, there's mm, a, there's mm. A, a, many, many different iterations of it. Amazing. Um, and it's meant very different things across time. So, so we could do a PhD on Toy Toy. <laughs> you could do a PhD on Toy Toy. Absolutely. It's amazing. I yeah. would, uh, where does that come from? <laughs> you know, you know where Alusa Continua comes from. That is one of the tasks you gave to me. So. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
But I was interviewing. I think it is Latin. Yeah, it's Latin. Yeah. 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 No, it, it, the language is Portuguese. It's Portuguese. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, oh, it means oh. the, literally the struggle so, continues. Yeah. But where did where did Samora get it from? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe yeah. yeah. <laughs> but the um, these Zimbabwean zebra guys trained in Angola mm. by the Cubans mm. all recognize each other by saying Adelante. Which means forward, forward. you know, oh, in really? Spanish, not even Portuguese, but in Spanish, even though they're trained in Angola by the Cubans with the Russians in charge. You know, it's wow. a completely transnational cultural mix. It's and gone. all these guys speak a bit of Russian and a bit of Spanish, and a bit, you know, it's, a, it's an incredibly interesting it's amazing, history. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And the cultural side of it has not been written about seriously. Mm. Everyone writes about the politics, the military. Mm. There's an idea for a PhD, guys. You may have a lot of yeah. That uh, you see, okay, I, I did literature also in undergrad and I did stylistics, so but this way of writing, are you conforming to them? Would you say, your, where, where would you place your poems in terms of what you've got sonnets, you've got uh, ballads, and mm -hmm. all that? Mm -hmm. Where would you place your poems? Do you know what? Uh, well, <laughs> Uh, probably none of the above and everything of the above. Why? <laughs> when I, when I, one thing that I did consciously was to actually reject to study um, necessarily, you know, to do, for example, to, to study poetry or to study, yeah. Mm -hmm. Why? I wanted, to, I, want, I wanted to kind of learn in a very organic way. So, you know, um, so that's something I did consciously. So I, I kind of, I'm not, I'm not very interested in, in um, traditions. Yeah, in criti yeah, the traditions or, or, or even how to critique it, I think that's for someone else. I just, I just write this stuff. And, and one thing I never do is sit down and say, I want to write a poem. I only write a poem when I feel compelled to write it. So in a sense, I feel like I'm not the one who wrote it. I feel like I was just a passenger in a sense. There's something that pushed me to write it and I'm just kind of, you know, kind of doing the mechanical yeah. stuff. So, yeah. <laughs> we, we should say it. Yeah, so we, uh, so in terms Your of the Brilliant. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> As a gift, I'd like to donate the, my book to your uh, to the development department. I don't know whether you have space. Oh, <laughs> 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 <laughs>